By the time you've already manifested something through the skin, it's what we call overflow. It's overflowed from the dosha and it's, it's overflowed from its seat and it's become systemic. So by the time it manifests through the layers of the skin, you've already had this going on in your body for a long time. So you have to think of plants and, and oils as energy. And I know this is a little bit of an abstract, esoteric kind of thing, but you have to work backwards from where you're at. Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Before we dive into today's episode, I want to thank my sponsor, Cus Cus Skincare. Cus Cus products were created to assist in reducing inflammation through the wisdom naturally found in botanical ingredients. All formulas are non-GMO, 99% organic, 100% plant-based, and crafted with love to help nourish and rejuvenate your skin. One of my favorite products, their Sen Face Serum, includes CBD. I found it helps reduce redness and is so incredibly light that it's the only face serum that I'll apply in the morning to rehydrate my skin. Now, if you don't know what products are best for your skin, they offer sample packs for both their face serums and body waxes, both of which, by the way, I have purchased. There are so many different products that I love, and I know you will too. To support your journey to healthier skin, Cuscus Cus is offering Healthy Skin Show listeners 20% off your first order. All you have to do is visit them at cuscus.com. That's K H U S hyphen K H U S dot com and join their email list to get access to the discount. Welcome back to episode number 27 of the Healthy Skin Show. Before we dive into today's conversation, which is going to be quite varied, we're going to touch on a little bit about diet and a little bit about plants and how plants can really help you on your skin journey. I wanted to say thank you so much to Yoga Mom 50. She left an amazing and really thoughtful review over on iTunes sharing that I'm so glad I found someone who is talking about solutions rather than the just deal with it mentality from doctors. I've been dealing with psoriasis for so long. Thanks for giving me hope that there may be something that I can do. Well, thank you so much too for tuning in and for also taking the time to leave that review. I really deeply appreciate it. So today I wanted to talk a little bit about a question that I often get asked, which is why do I recommend that my clients go gluten-free when they may not actually have any GI or digestive issues and they might not even be sensitive to gluten? My reason for making this recommendation actually has nothing to do with whether you are quote unquote sensitive to gluten or not. Gluten is one of the only food proteins that has the capacity to increase a leakiness or permeability through your gut lining. So your gut or digestive tract is really only one cell layer thick and each cell needs to butt up next to its neighbor in a very tight fashion. However, when gluten is thrown into the mix, into your digestive system, no matter whether you are gluten sensitive or not, it increases gut permeability which can, in those that are having health problems, make it a challenge for your system to handle what can possibly sneak in those junctions that should be tight, but for however long are no longer. So if you've got gut infections or too much candida living in the digestive system, any number of things that are going wrong, including the inability to properly break protein down. So instead of it being absorbed in the small intestine, Partially undigested fragments are ending up inside your body and thus causing inflammation because of the type of reaction that is triggered within the body where a food protein shouldn't be. Also, those food proteins end up further down in the digestive tract, in the colon specifically, and end up getting fermented by the bacteria and organisms that live there. That is an inappropriate way for those proteins to be broken down. So generally speaking, I recommend that gluten be removed from the diet at least for the duration of the time that I'm working with my clients. And that could be for a few months. It could be for a year. Either way, we're allowing the body to calm down. We're taking away a potential trigger 
Is it possible that gluten in and of itself could be the sole underlying root cause for your rashes? Sure, it's possible. Unfortunately, it's not very likely that that is going to fix you. I think it's very important that I state this clearly and very plainly because I see all over a lot of Facebook groups that are dedicated to chronic skin issues that people have gotten it into their head that if they take out gluten, they take out dairy, they take out eggs, and the diet becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, that somehow the food is going to fix the rashes. And I can promise you that no amount of time being gluten-free is likely to resolve ongoing, long, chronic rash problems. I wish that it was that simple. If that was the case, I wouldn't have developed eczema in the first place because I had been gluten-free for eight years prior to developing the eczema, gluten-free, dairy-free, and egg-free. And yet I still ended up with dyshidratic eczema on my hands. And unfortunately, all of the clients that I work with have pretty much all gone gluten-free already on their own. They've also removed other foods and found it to be minimally at best helpful. I just want to be very clear that the power of food in these instances may not be as strong as we'd like it to be, especially when there are other underlying causes that can be driving the inflammation and the symptoms, and that oftentimes someone's particular root cause puzzle is likely to be a combination of three to five different root causes rather than just one specific thing. If you're lucky, it might be just one specific thing. But what I don't want is for you to walk away from listening to this, having an unrealistic view of what may work or what to try, a false sense of hope that might help you in the immediate sense But long term, as things carry on and drag on for a month, two months, six months, a year, you start to realize that all of the efforts that you've put into and focused around your diet aren't actually yielding any results. And it becomes incredibly frustrating. And so unless we have very clear data that demonstrates a high or moderate sensitivity Gluten is likely the only thing that I will ask you to remove and maintain very strictly, whereas I generally do believe that you should have a cleaned up diet and you should eat as nutrient dense of a diet as humanly possible. But what I don't want for someone to think is that they have to give up more and more and more foods because the key really is to be good about gluten. Other diet recommendations beyond that would be tailored to your particular situations. One piece of the gluten puzzle that's often overlooked for people that are going gluten-free is when it comes to oats. Oats can be an issue for people because of the way that they are grown, harvested, stored, and processed, oftentimes resulting in a very high level of contamination of gluten. So one of the pieces to keep in mind here is that when it comes to gluten-free oats, you do have to actually get certified gluten-free oats because oats are highly contaminated. They don't contain gluten in and of itself. There are other forms of gluten and that's a conversation for another day. But in this particular instance, what you want to do is purchase certified gluten-free oats and keep them stored away from regular oats that you may have purchased for the rest of your family or products that you have used in the past. And if you buy food products, one little tip is to make sure that when oats are present in a particular product, if you don't have celiac disease and you're not highly sensitive to gluten in general, then the trick would be to make sure that either they're using gluten-free oats or that the product has a label on it that it has been certified gluten-free to make sure that those oats were safe. And last but not least, if you decide to go the dairy-free route and purchase oat milk, it is also critical that you make sure that the oats they used have been either tested or were certified gluten-free. That way, again, you're avoiding any potential cross-contamination issues where you are coming in contact with gluten. And yes, the issue is large enough that it does warrant being cautious here because you might say, well, I don't have an issue to gluten, so why does it matter if I need to be that careful around oats? Testing of oat products has shown that they are highly contaminated. So in this case, 
I would recommend that you look for certified gluten-free oats for all of the food products that you consume or just oatmeal in general if that's a part of your daily diet. If you want to learn more about what foods may be triggers for your skin conditions, head back and listen to episode number eight with my colleague, Jennifer Brand. With that said, I want to dive into today's conversation. That way you feel more comfortable around choosing the right products for your skin. And the right products in this particular case are things that you would apply topically to your skin. If you've been coming from that whole world of what's available to you in packaging over at the local grocery store or your local pharmacy, it can be then daunting to go out and start purchasing more natural products and more natural plant-based oil products that are available through companies that work directly with these oils, formulating products that may or may not be the right fit for you. It's my hope that this conversation today will offer a ton of insight. So let's get started. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. Today, I have a very special guest joining me. Her name is Christy Bluestein, and she is an Ayurvedic specialist, an Ayurvedic health practitioner, an aromatherapist, an herbalist, a Panchakarma specialist, and founder and creator of Cuscus Modern Urban Fusion, which is, by the way, one of my absolute favorite skincare lines. And I had this amazing conversation with Christy a couple of months ago about skincare in general and some of the big issues that I had with it. And I asked her, I was like, could you come on the podcast and talk about this? Because I think a lot of people don't understand that a lot of what's formulated out there, even the natural products, can contain preservatives that can be quite irritating. So first of all, Christy, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate the invite. It's, it's been wonderful meeting you and, and chatting with you about skin health and, and dietary health and all the things that go into skincare. Can you talk to us a little bit? I think this is a good question and a good place to start is that there's an explosion of these natural, super healthy skincare brands that claim to not have any preservatives. But this is, we were talking about this, about how some of them have these amazing odors and you smell so great. And you had said something to me specific about the preservatives that people kind of sneak into products that the consumer doesn't necessarily know about. So can you just talk a little bit about that? I think one of the things that gets placed into some natural products, or what we call greenwashing in the industry, is where they portray to be green. And then when you really get into the ingredients, there's a, a, a myriad of isolated compounds that mimic certain constituents in, in plants, right? So some of them come from plants, and that's that's fine as long as you have the whole plants in them to kind of balance out that effect. However, I think one of the things that gets stuck in a lot is, is synthetic fragrances or fragrance oils, which aren't really taken from, it's like a, a synthetic form of lavender or something that mimics the compounds of lavender to smell like lavender, but isn't really lavender kind of thing. You know, when they distill a plant, we're, we're, we're obviously sourcing is huge when you get to uh, essential oils and things like that. A lot of, uh, like, I think the, the last statistic on lavender was 80% of it has been adulterated. And that can be in the manufacturing process before the consumer actually even touches it. The essential oils are known in the aromatherapy world and people that buy them and work with them is well known to be adulterated. Um, it's cheaper you know, to do that. I mean, if you're, you're talking about sourcing, like what we use is wild French lavender, where it's cultivated in an ethical fashion, sustainably harvested, and then it's steam distilled at the facility. And then, but you're paying a premium for these type of oils, you know, but with products, it works like this. It's the same as a chef or a food. Your products can only be as good as your ingredients, right? So in terms of natural products, you'll see certain things that are really low on the environmental working group as toxicity, maybe they're at like a five, <laughs> you know, or maybe they're at a two, you know, but there's still compounds that can be contained in certain products that can cause liver toxicity and issues of that nature. So is there a way if somebody's looking at some of these 
I'm putting it in air quotes for those that are listening just to the audio, but these like green natural products, is there any way for the consumer to know if they're putting a lot of like unnatural preservatives and things in it that might, I mean, a lot of times people list some ingredients. They don't list all the ingredients. I I don't know. I just find it, it's sort of like the wild west a little bit. It is a little bit of an unregulated area. However, you're supposed to denote whether or not it's organic. You're supposed to have the Latin name of the plant and then the name of the plant next to it. I mean, there's no getting around reading the labels. This is just something that if you you want to take control of your health, you have to take the time to do. There's so many compounds and names of chemicals out there. And I don't want to say that all chemicals are, are bad for you because that's not exactly the case. You have like citric acid is not bad if it's in a, in a formula, things like that. But what I'm saying is that you need to kind of look and search. And there are websites that can help and assist people to find out. Like I mentioned, the Environmental Working Group, you can put in any ingredient into their website and find out what the toxicity level is on that. I choose not to use, our thing is about herbalism and getting herbs into people's bodies. So I choose to use as less preservatives as possible. We use antioxidant protection. We use, well, essential oils and and carrier oils alike have natural antioxidant properties in them. So you're able to stabilize the product that way. So you don't necessarily need all of these preservatives unless you're mixing oil and water together because of the mold issue. But if your products are not doing that, then you don't really have to be too concerned with it. Obviously, you want them stored properly. You want to take care of them. And natural products are, they're not as convenient as what we've been using, but they're better for you. (laughs) you know, in that respect. Yeah. And so one of the things that drew me, actually, this was the thing, this is how I found you. I was doing some reading on, I don't know, I was doing some reading on like CBD in skincare products. And I found some article and I saw your products in there. And I was like, because you have CBD oil in one of your serums, the Sen, Sen serum, I believe it is, correct? And we have one in our copious body serum, and then we have a hand nail and foot okay. treatment. Okay, cool. So you've got these these items, and I was like, I need to try this. <laughs> I mean, I have had a lot of experience with CBD with clients who have skin issues, but this was the first time that I had really seen it in something that you could apply topically that was appeared to be a really nourishing formula, and so I got some some of the products from you and i fell in love like head over heels so can you just talk a little bit about why did you choose to add cbd oil to products in the first place i've been an advocate for the normalization for marijuana in general for years my husband has worked in the industry for many many years we live in colorado <laughs> we live in the mountains i'm I don't have a lot of taboo around the topic. I'm very, I've been in Colorado for eight years. I'm pretty, we're pretty enlightened when it comes to the use of cannabis sativa. I'm an herbalist. I'm interested in all plants. I mean, this species of marijuana, cannabis sativa is a very prolific species, like one of the most on the planet. I mean, in terms of just everything. I mean, if you think about what people have been willing to do for this for this plant. However, I wanted to formulate it similar to the way I would formulate it with any other plant and stop demonizing this beautiful plant with full of we were up to over a thousand constituents. We were not even we haven't even studied it enough to figure out what what really is going on with this plant. My friend of mine contacted me. She owned a spa. She said, "Hey, can you make me a serum?" She's like, "Have you heard of this?" I looked it up. And I was like, "Oh, I can do this." You know, I don't want to say that I said I could do it better, but that's actually what happened. And I, <laughs> and I it's true. And I said, "Because they're not formulated correctly." And when I say correctly, is when when you study herbalism, you you use a method called herbal compounding. It's where you look for like actions and you build on those actions. So basically, I found out that CBD is an anti-inflammatory, a nervine sedative, um, a relaxant, um, all these things. And so I bolstered it with other nervine sedatives, relaxants, analgesics, pain management, and created a formula. that This is why all of our formulas are written, by the way, to take action on the nervous system. And I felt that given the what it was used for and what we kind of know, we're still, we're still learning. We're still learning. Okay. But 
from what I understand about the plant is that it fits into the cellular activity like a puzzle piece. So it creates metabolic function based on what's the, you know, those cells that have been produced, but they're not active yet. It sees what kind of bonds that cell needs in order to create that particular action in the body. It mimics it, and then that function is created in the body. So it helps stabilize the system. In particular, I liked its anti-inflammatory response in the body because I feel that that is where we're seeing a lot of dysregulation in the body. This is where we're manifesting skin issues or, or metabolic skin issues. Um, so I thought it was great. We bolstered it with wild French lavender, um, frankincense, and you know, and and the rhododendron, which takes action on the liver. So I always say, clean liver, clean blood, clean skin kind of thing. So just all in all, it's just a very powerful, highly focused formula. So you're getting the benefit of not just the CBD, but you're also getting the benefit of the other plants that are in the product that are bolstering the cannabis sativa plant in the product. Just out of curiosity, you know, because you have worked with clients, you know, my experience has been that a lot of times getting some the right type of oils can be incredibly key to nourishing the skin from the outside in. Because right, we have to look at a two-pronged approach of inside out and outside in when you've got a chronic skin problem. Have you found that these, even for people, like say you don't have perfect skin, you've got some rashes, like real dry spots problems. Have you found that these rashes, like for somebody who's listening to this, like would these be something to give a try as part of their regimen as opposed to going to like the stuff, the extreme dry skin repair at at CVS, <laughs> you know, or they're just buying some formulated chemical that they're slathering all over the place. If you are manifesting any type of metabolic skin condition, you should detoxify everything. It should start obviously with your skincare. And yeah, and of course, yes. But here's the thing that it can get concerns me sometimes is that using the natural products, but still, you know, you're still using synthetic commercial makeup. You know, you're still getting the chemicals into the bloodstream that way. And then so is it going to have the greatest effect? Probably not. I mean, you know, will it have some effect? I think so, but it's going to take time. By the time you've already manifested something through the skin, it's what we call overflow. It's overflowed from the dosha and on our event. It's, it's overflowed from its seat and it's become systemic. So by the time it manifests through the layers of the skin, you've already had this going on in your body for a long time. So you have to think of plants and, and oils as energy. And I know this is a little bit of an abstract esoteric kind of thing, but you have to work backwards from where you're at. So you have to take the time that it took to get you metabolically out of balance. You have to kind of work inwards <laughs> this way. And so, yeah, I would say that it would take some time to kind of clean out the system and allow the cells to have that, that cellular communication that you need. But I think that over time, you will see improvement as long as you continue to detoxify your environment. And that goes for all synthetic, the synthetic candles and the Febreze and the laundry detergent and the cleaning supplies and the, all of it has to kind of go. And I know it's hard for people and you see huge transition. I went through it myself. It wasn't like I was, I was born like I didn't, I wasn't born into a family that was like, you know, <laughs> yeah, my parents still use chemicals. Um, you know, even, even though I talked to them about it in a million times, I mean, but you, it's a transition, but once you start to see the rewards of that transition, I don't think you go back to saying, Hey, I want to put this on. You start to really realize how bad these things are for people and for you. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I appreciate you joining us so much again. <laughs> and you're welcome. Just as an aside to the conversation that you just heard, there is a lot to learn and know about all the different types of oils out there. There are some that you may be more familiar with and others less so. It doesn't mean that one is necessarily better than the other. And considering that we all have different sensitivities and allergies, what works for you may not work for someone else. That's why it's amazing and wonderful that we have so many options to choose from. I'd love to hear your thoughts and experiences on purchasing as well as using these types of oils and such on your skin. So feel free to leave a comment on this podcast so that we can continue the conversation there. And if you've got other questions on other topics, anything that you've been dying to ask, head on over to healthyskinshow.com 
scroll down and you'll see a little box where you can leave us a voicemail and we will include your question in an upcoming episode. I love being able to connect you with the answers that you're looking for rather than having you waste tons of time searching on the internet and finding what ends up to be questionable information. And remember, if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to the podcast, share it with a friend or two, and I'll see you in the next episode.